Well, thank you. I have already given some considerations uh, in the earlier morning, and um, we have been challenged to give rules for existing structures. And um, I think we should realize that it is good to give rules, but it is not free that you are don't need to have understanding, because understanding the behavior of a structure, an existing structure, is also very important at least as important as satisfying rules. Well, this uh, picture I have shown already, and we had three main categories, how to determine the residual hidden bearing capacity of an existing structure, a sound structure, how to assess the effect of material deterioration on the bearing capacity, how to assess the bearing capacity of structures with non-conforming details. And if you see these two, structures, they are basically the same. Huh? They are both bridges in a similar way, and this is an old one, and this is a new one. And we had to face the question, what do we do with the new model code? Do we need two separate codes for uh, deteriorated structures or existing structures and for new structures? And you would say, if you look to this, then it's better to take two different codes. But on the other hand, the systems are the same. Uh, and can we integrate it in such a way that we cover everything? Well, the, the, what we have taken as a decision is that we have one code, but for both. And this is really a challenge. So we have the three questions. What to do with existing structures without deterioration? What to do with existing structures with deterioration? And what to do with existing structures with non-compliant details? And I will show you that it's really an adventure to come to um, good... Um, recommendations. At first, we take structures without deterioration. In our country, the Netherlands, we had many solid slab bridges. And uh, an early analysis based on the simplification of uh, checking the design capacity showed that many of them should be unsafe on the basis of this consideration. But we were not very sure about this. And therefore, um, Cylinders have been drilled from the top and from the bottom of a number of uh, these solid slab viaducts. And we came to a very surprising result. And the result was that the average compressive strengths, these are cube strength values, they are very high, much higher than the capacity which was required in design uh, 50 or 60 years ago. And this is very remarkable. But another thing was also remarkable, because these values are high, the compressive strength, and if you take the splitting strength, they're also very high, according to the relation between the two. But if we take the centric tensile strength, they were very low. And sometimes even, they had drilled cylinders from the bottom and it just dropped off. That means tensile strength zero. And then you have really a problem, because the shear capacity is a function of the concrete strength or the concrete tensile strength. And if you look to the formula, it's more the concrete tensile strength. So is it zero or not? This was a very important question. And uh, therefore, it was necessary to find out why we had this very crazy result. And uh, it turned out that um, the beams, sorry, the beams that we had, and we opened the cylinders here, you see that everywhere you had small, uh, bleeding below the rough particles. That means if you have your drills vertically and you, you pull, well, then you have all these, all these weak areas are determining your result. But for splitting, it is different. And for compression, it is also different. But what is in the, in the, in the, in the shear capacity? Well, if you have shear capacity, then you have cracks developing like this. So they are not interfering too much with these bleeding areas. So we thought maybe we can take full profit of this higher strength, but we are not so sure. And therefore we have done a lot of tests here in the labs, and these confirmed the idea that this is really the point. Huh? So if you have these low tensile strength values, they do not interfere with the shear capacity. But this is typically a conclusion that you only can do if you have done these tests. But this was not the only, the only point, because 
we were very happy that our compressive strength and splitting tensor strength was about 35% higher than in the design, eh, because this saves a lot, a lot of, of, of repair and strengthening actions. Eh. But there is another thing, and that's also what we can see in the model code 2010. There is a sustained loading factor. For compression, it is 0.8. For tension, it is 0.6. And if we look to the behavior in shear, the tensor strength plays a very big role. That means we have to multiply everything with 0.6 if, we, if the codes are okay. So we lose our 25% gain in strength by multiplying this with 0.6. But do we have to multiply 0.6 in the formula or do we multiply it with the shear capacity? So these are very basic questions. Huh? So we did tests and we said, okay, let's take long-term tests on beams. And we had beams like this. We did a number of tests, short-term tests, coming to failure in, in two minutes. And then we put valued loads on this uh, up to 95%. And then we wait what happens. And also this result was surprising, but nothing happens. And we had even, we had even beams loaded to 93%. And it stayed like 10 years, for 10 years. We just, uh, shortly ago, we brought them to failure. So there is no sustained loading factor in shear. And what is the reason? Also that we could find out. Because here, according to the theory also, the aggregate interlock plays a very big role the in, in defining the shear capacity. So if there is any sustained loading effect on the shear tension, this crack will grow a little bit, but in the meantime, the aggregate interlock compensates it. It is a hardening effect. So therefore we could be very happy because we could use the higher tensile strength, the, the higher strength of the concrete. And all these things you should know huh, in order to, to come to right conclusions. It is not necessary to say we have to drill there and there and there and so many and what is the uh, coefficient of variation. You should also understand. Huh? And sometimes you need tests to understand. This is another one. This is also a large series of bridges with a very thin decks and the capacity uh, of the punching shear huh, was not, not sufficient if you have more large B loads there. But Aurelio just told that there is another effect. All these punching shear tests, they are done on free specimens with free edges which can rotate. And this is not the case in a real structure, in a real slab. And therefore we have done many tests. So we have here, the test is a, a model of one to two. And this is the lady, Sana Amir. So you can see the, which is the, the size of the, of the specimen. And uh, we have also in this case uh, used finite element approach. So we had finite element analysis. And as I said this morning, if you have a number of results, then you can calibrate. And this calibration shows that you can simulate the results very well. Huh? This was for 14 tests, experiment and calculated 1.02, coefficient of point variation 0.11. So such a calibrated uh, finite element model can be very useful, especially in this case, because we have 70 large bridges and we could show in this way that they don't need strengthening. So also for sustainability, this is a big result. Also here we have a deteriorated suction, suction and uh, we spoke about um, this morning about ASR. And I said, cracking is the language of concrete structures. And this is also true for this situation, because what we see here, we had these viaducts and we have taken sawn beams from that. And the, these beams, they show horizontal cracks, short horizontal cracks everywhere. And that is because these slabs are very heavily reinforced in the top and the bottom. That means if the ASR reaction lead to expanding, it is pre-stressing the beam in the axial direction, but not in the other direction. So we have plenty of tests, plenty of cracks um, in horizontal direction, but nothing in vertical direction. And then the question is, what about shear capacity? And if you have horizontal cracks, we had the same argument as the previous one, the horizontal cracks for flexural shear and the formation of cracks, they are not hindered by these horizontal cracks. 
But there is another thing which is also important that you have normally you have shear tension failure. There's another one, huh? so that you have the in the web uh, exceeding the tensor strength, and then you have shear tension. But this is only in, in thin webs. But because of this cracking pattern, it happens that we have shear tension. We have the shear tension, huh? and this is not from a bending crack. But if we control those, then it turned out that this is well um, reproducible, because the point is that in a vertical direction, there is a strong reduction of the concrete tensile strength due to all these cracks. In the other direction, not. So we have a distribution of tensile strength depending on the inclination. And in that case, we could easily find out a model which is ex explaining that. So also when, when you have to um, make assessment, you have to think about, you must know what can happen. Huh? So it is so important that we do not rely on formulas, but that we rely on understanding of, uh, of models. Then we have non-conforming details. And I said already that uh, um, in the past, for instance, smooth steel has been used on a large scale, and now you cannot get it anymore. Huh? And uh, in the Netherlands, we had the, the big question, what about all our bridges with smooth steel? Huh? What about the shear capacity? Well, another interesting thing is um, that we found uh, publications from 1960, 1960, so uh, 60 years ago. Professor Leonard did test, and he did test with smooth steel, what you see here, uh, no, smooth steel, and rib steel, and he compared the results because he wanted to know how reducing is the effect of not having rib steel. And the results are very surprising because with rib reinforcement, shear capacity was 58, and with plain longitudinal reinforcement, it was, it was double. And this was very remarkable. And later on, it could be explained because if you have smooth steel, and Leonard smoothened also the, the steel artificially, then you have no inclined cracks. They cannot develop because they develop in this way. And that was the reason. But of course, um, is this the reality? Huh? So at Steel Delft by Yang Yu Guang, who was also here, uh, tests were carried out with plain bars and red bars. And plain bars, if you do not do anything, well, they are a little bit rusted always. Huh? And if you compare them, then the result was much smaller. And smooth steel and red steel, they were in a range of, of about 10%. That means it is no problem if you have smooth steel, but you should not take profit of this to increase it. So also here, understanding is very important. And um, I spoke also about the level of approximation this morning. Uh, and we think if we go higher and higher, then we are more and more accurate. But there is a warning. If you are dealing with deteriorated structures, deteriorate reinforcement, it's much more difficult to, to come up to the right conclusion. And an evaluation by Miguel Prieto uh, showed that if you have the level two and the level three, then the level two, which is the less accurate, is better agreement than the level three. And this can be because you cannot really estimate the properties for the inf input values. You cannot really see if the, if the, if the bar is corroding, and there is micro cracking around, it can be that you do not see that outside. There are no cracks outside, but inside the bond is reduced. And these types of things you don't know exactly. And if you don't know, you should have a larger margin of safety and then you go down. So you must take it with, with, with really with knowledge of the behavior, what can happen. Um, one very important aspect also, which is shortly treated in the in the in the model in the new model code is uh, testing um, um, uh, proof load by proof loading, and um, if you look to recommendations from the past, because this is not a new technology, you see that you have um, you have the expected value, you have the value that you have to reach, and then you have the dead load of the structure, which is there anyhow, so there is no doubt about it. 
and then you have the, the load which is on top and you hope that it reaches this one. Huh? But there are stop criteria. When do you have to stop? And these criteria in the past, they say, okay, if the crack is more than that or if, if the deformation is more than that. But we have seen how complicated shear models can be. And what is the stop criteria for shear? Also here, research is still going on. Uh, and therefore it is necessary to really explain very well what is done, what should be done, what are the criteria. And here now uh, interesting research is being carried out uh, also with regard to uh, acoustic emission. Uh, uh, acoustic emission can be, you can much more take profit of this uh, as was demonstrated by tests and this will further be developed. This is the last one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we have worked as a working group uh, 3.2 uh, about modeling structural performance of existing structures and a state-of-the-art report is ready and uh, it needs some formalities and then it will also be available and you can find back many of those things that I have uh, told and much more in this report. So I think it is not only useful to take the code, the code rules, but also know what is behind. Thank you for your interest. Very nice, Jorf. Thank, Thank you. you. A question for yours, or even two this time. Oh, Johan. Thank you very much. I think this is very interesting. But but uh, I, I'm not surprised that the benefits of old uh, structures because uh, in old times we used cement with the larger particles, so there, there's exactly. a lot uh, more exactly. uh, strain gate. Uh, stress gain and then we also used more aggregates with larger particles so we had less cement paste giving less uh, uh, creep and shrinkage and more ag aggregate interlock are all these uh, factors uh, uh, included in this chapter leading to less material expenses and less carbon dioxide yeah but this is this is a, a gift from the past huh? we did not realize that and we get it as a, as a present huh? but now we are more accurate and more accurate and uh, then we lose this profit and therefore we have also to um, to design with more simplified rules so that you pay a little bit more uh, and take profit of the better formulations the more advanced models when you have to assess so i think we should not be going with the design to the to the limit which is required because we can very well use if there is any reserve uh, it pays back multi times many times hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Horst. Okay. Thank you.